Hello and a warm welcome. I'm Armin Trost, professor at the Furtwangen University in Germany. And this is my series on human resources strategies, a real master course for advanced HR students, professionals and executives. This series is available on YouTube and on all podcatchers like iTunes or Spotify. All slides that support this series are available on my website. For more information, please read the description to this YouTube or podcast. I'd also like to refer to my book, Human Resources Strategies, available at most online bookstores. So, again, thanks for listening. Have fun and gain valuable insights into the fascinating world of HR strategies. So welcome everybody. This is episode number 24 and we start talking about talent management, which is a significant topic in HR. And this episode will be about the fundamental idea, the fundamental challenges of talent management. And in the next episode, we're going to talk about competence model. Then in the episode after this, we're going to talk about the talent identification. And then we're going to talk about strategies for talent development. So I guess there will be four episodes around talent management on a very strategic level. And um, when we think about talent management, there is one particular question in the room, which is, who are your most talented people and what do you do with them? Jack Welch, when he became the CEO of General Electric, he always brought up this question. So when he was the young CEO, he visited divisions, of course, uh, there was the red carpet <laughs> rolled out for, for Czech Welch, yeah, the great CEO and the executives in the different divisions. They have prepared numbers and numbers and numbers, thousands of pages of reports, every kind of KPI about profit, quality, efficiency and all these things. And then he surprised the executives with this question. He said, hey, okay, the numbers are nice, okay, nice, interesting, but... What really, what really matters is this one question. Who are you most talented people and what do you do with them? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that was a genius idea of Czech Welch. And this question became one of his, uh, we could say this is, became a core of this entire business model. Saying, okay, you have to understand who are the most talented people and then you do something with them, right? Um, and... Uh, here, two things are uh, related to this question. First, you have to understand who is talented and not. Who, who, whoever, who, whoever is supposed to understand it. Is it, is it yourself, yourself as an employee, or is it the organization? I, I will come to that. And what does that mean? What do you do with them, right? Is it to retain them? Is it that you uh, increase the salary? Is it that you support them on the long run with regards to their career? And what is it? Yeah. Okay, so here is, a, here is a fundamental idea. And I would like to refer to something that I have explained earlier, in particular in an episode which was about critical roles, critical functions. So there we were talking about bottleneck functions and key functions. Right. Uh, if you're not familiar with bottleneck functions and key functions, then I might refer to this, but I'm going to repeat it real quick for you. A bottleneck function is a function where you have a high demand. You constantly are looking for good people, not the best, just the good maybe, right? Um, you are constantly looking for engineers. You're constantly looking for software developers. You're constantly looking for truck drivers. And, and you, you've, you see that it's very hard to hire these people from the outside because there is a limited availability in the labor market. And you need many of them constantly. This is what we name a bottleneck function. And a key function is a function where you need the best. Why do you need the best? Because in those functions, you want to be better than your competitors. So, if your organization is about innovation, if you want to be more innovative than your competitors, you better have the best people in specific positions in your research and development function, probably. Right? So, 
I don't want to repeat this too, too intensively, but key functions. And key functions very often are also very hard to be filled because of limited availability. I mean, the best of the best are rare, okay? So, and, and, and now here's the idea. The idea is that you might not hire the best, you might not hire the suitable, you might not hire uh, the people that you actually need, you might hire them for for functions in your organization that are more easy to be filled. So, for example, it might be still simple or easier for you as an organization to hire trainees. Okay, a trainee is a beginner. A trainee is a graduate. is not is not is not developed to his fullest uh, potential, but it might be still simple to hire trainees. Higher availability. Okay, hire them from the outside and then develop them in the inside. Okay, into bottleneck functions, into key functions. That's a fundamental idea. Okay, um, and when we talk about talent management, you must see that it's not only about filling um, key functions, bottleneck functions. It's not about just filling senior positions. It's not just about executive positions. It's also about expert positions. Okay, so talent management. To sum it up, are all these things you as a company do to fill bottleneck functions and key functions, also including key positions. Okay, so talent management involves both talent acquisition and talent development. But in reality, when we look at companies. And you ask them, hey, what do you do as part of your talent management? They mainly think about talent development. Okay, talent development. Developing people from the inside. That's the idea. And now when we look at executive positions, and this is what most companies mainly think of, we again have to think about these different management layers, so to speak. And um, also in an earlier episode, I was talking about this uh, uh, we have employees in the button and then we have team team leads yeah that's a kind of next hemisphere i named it layer yeah manager managing teams yeah and above this level there is the level that we also call managers managing managers the triple m this is the middle management and then we have top management managers managing organizations these are the executives this is what we name the c level CEO, CIO, CTO, CHRO, and so on. Okay, so we have these different layers. Okay, and now the idea is that companies fill management positions, senior management positions, executive, posi executive positions from the inside. Right, that, that, that's, that's very often an idea. Uh, we talk about internal development. It's not about, it's about make, not buy. I mean, these again, these are these two options you have of an organization. Either you buy the people, meaning externally hiring the people, or you make the people. You develop them from the inside, right? So you look at, okay, who is an employee who has much potential who is an employee who is extremely talented, and then you develop this employee to the next layer, to the next layer, to the next layer, to his or her fullest potential. Okay, And very often companies have what we name an internal placement rate. What is that internal placement rate? Uh, it's about when you look at management positions, for instance, yeah, uh, you want that uh, specific... Uh, percentage of positions are filled internally, right? Um, so um, I, I always ask this uh, some HR directors or uh, CHROs. Uh, do you have an internal basement rate? Sometimes they say, "Oh well, we don't have an official one, but we have we have one. We have at least an idea saying that uh, two out of three executives are own employees, meaning." Two out of three executive positions are filled from the inside. And that's that's a good idea. Really, that's a good idea. 
Um, why is that a good idea? Because you now there, there are studies out there. I don't want to go too deep into science here, but there are studies. What happens when you hire a superstar from the outside? What happens very often is when you hire a superstar from the outside, a superstar is somebody who succeeded in another organization, right? who was very successful in the last few years. So you hire this person. Probability is high that this, the performance of this person will drop, at least in the beginning. Why? Because this superstar yeah, is facing a new environment, a new system, a new culture, new colleagues. He or she is not used to, right? And um, we also know that um, the, the, the risk of voluntary turnover is very high when you hire people from the outside, especially in the, in the very first uh, uh, six months. So, so when you hire somebody from the outside, and, and you, might, you might have engaged an executive search company, you have paid one-third of the annual total salary as a fee to the executive search. I mean, that's the typical fee, right? Uh, you don't want that this new executive will look, drop his or her performance and will voluntarily leave in, uh, in, a, in a short period of time. You don't want this. But probability is high. It's high. So you might better develop people from the inside. And also, I mean, when you hire people from the outside for executive positions, for manager positions, this is a message to the existing people saying you are not good enough. I mean, there are people who want to grow. There are people who, who work like hell and they, they expect that maybe someday they will get promoted to a next layer, earning more, gain more responsibility. And they're staring at a position, say, oh, that could be mine, <laughs> right, uh, on the next layer. And then he or she learns that somebody was hired from the outside. This is the message that you are not good enough and that will demotivating the people who are already there. So there are various reasons why you better develop people from the inside. But it's not always good just to hire people from the inside. Sometimes it's good to hire people from the outside because with hiring people from the outside, you gain new perspective. You gain the, the what we also name the fresh blood, as we say. Yeah? New inspiration. You gain also knowledge from other companies. So 100% internal placement rate, which is anyway not realistic, but... 100% internal placement rate is, is not healthy. But maybe, I don't know, I mean, there is no scientific uh, indication for that, but, but maybe 70%, 80%, uh, some, something like this, okay? So, this is what we're talking about, developing people from the inside. And as I said, there are two things that companies need to solve now, new, new, two problems. Two real problems. If you want to develop people from the inside, okay, then here's the challenge. I mean, with every layer, they pass. When you, when you, when you are an employee and, and you become a team lead, the world will be completely different for you as a team lead. And when you're a team lead and you get promoted to become a middle manager, your world will completely change. And again, when you move from middle management to top management, your world will completely change. And how can you tell that somebody has the potential to be successful on the next layer? How can you tell this? I mean, if somebody is very successful as a software developer, how can you tell whether this employee might be also a good head of software development? If somebody is very good in sales, how can you tell whether this person will become a good team lead? How can you tell this? How can you predict this? How can you tell whether somebody has the potential to, on the long run, develop? be able to develop into a certain level into a certain position and this is this is really this is really a significant challenge in one of the next episodes the other thing is once you have identified those people where you think they have potential okay how can you make sure that they on the long run will develop okay and that happens not overnight that happens over years okay so let me share a view because we need it in this moment 
about about development. There was a study published by um, McKinsey Associates. Um, uh, they 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 ask managers, they ask executives. Um, hey, executives! I mean, obviously you were successful in your career. <laughs> I mean, you you made it to become an executive. Wow, that's pretty cool. So, hey, what was important to your development? What was critical so that you became an executive? And how well did the companies you've been working with, how well did they provide what was critical to you? This study was also published uh, in, the, in this great book, The War for Talent. Uh, the War for Talent, really one of the most excellent HR books, I would say. A little bit outdated, I would say, but that was a, a great book uh, in, the, in the late 90s. Um, uh, it's worth to read it. Um, so they were asking people this, and I don't want to go too deep into into what these executives said, but they said things like, "Yeah, it was very important to me to get promoted uh, uh, quickly. Uh, fast rotation and advancements was was really critical. I had something like a 360 degree feedback that was really cool. What really helped me was something like a candid, insightful feedback. I had a great mentor. I also attended traditional classroom training that was pretty cool. I did an MBA or something like this. Yeah, you know. Uh, so different things. And when you look at these different things, executives typically mention. And you have a closer look, and you want to simplify these these kind of insights. You're gonna learn that something about seventy percent is based seventy percent is based on experience, seventy percent. So, whatever you learn, seventy percent probably is based on experience. The things you have done, the project you've been working with, the challenges you were faced with. 20% is learning from and with others. You had great colleagues, you had a great mentor, you had people you, you, you could learn from. 10% is about training, formal training, classroom training, an MBA program or whatever. So this led to the 10, 20, 70 rule, 70, 20, 10 rule. 70% you learn based on experience, 20% you learn based on uh, from and with others, 10% through formal training. Uh, it's a very simplified formula, and it's wrong to say, okay, training is not important. It's just 10%. Very often, training, formal training, also training in the university, by the way, which is classroom training very often, is a prerequisite for the rest. If you have had, if you have attended a good training where you learn the fundamentals, then you will more succeed, you will more advanced, more advanced in, in experience. So the training might be a good preparation for all the rest. So please do not look at these things in a very separate way. But we're gonna look at these development measures more closely in a in a later episode. Now what I would like to do now is look at a very classic approach. And then after this, I would like to share with you three different approaches. Uh, that you it might follow. And this is a kind of ground for everything we're going to discuss around talent management in the upcoming, in the upcoming episode. So when you look in most companies globally, mid-size, large organization, and you ask them, okay, do you have talent management? Probably the, the CHRO would say, oh, yes, yes, we have talent management. Mm, okay, pretty cool. Okay, uh, here's a piece of paper. Can you can you tell me how your talent management works? Can you tell me? Sure, I can. <laughs> and and what, what he or she will present to you probably is the following concept. They all start very often with a competence model. What is a competence model? This will be the next episode. A competence model is something that describes how people should be. An executive, for instance. Yeah? We already had this when we talked about executive education. Yeah. Uh, you, you, it's a set of competencies that 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 are used as a kind of a framework for your evaluation, for development, for for promotion, for whatever. It says what is required to succeed on a certain level or in a certain job. That's a competence model. Okay, now 
here the thing starts. You might have a review as part of the performance appraisal, maybe. That's that's something that happens annually still in many organizations. So the question is, who are the A players, who are the B players, who are the C players? That's the first question, let's say, among others. But that's that's key to understand, okay, who are the 10%, the 20% of our high performers? Okay, but this is still not enough. You not only think about the high performers, you also want to think who has much potential. So it's not just the question, who is already very, very good? Who has the potential to become even better? And this very often happens, and there's an entire episode about this. Uh, what, you, what is done very often is something like a talent review. Yeah, a talent review. And the purpose of a talent review is, to put it simple, is to come up with a list in the end, saying, okay, uh, we have looked, we had a look, we, the managers, we, the executives, we had a look at all the people in our division, maybe, yeah, in our company, and we wanted to understand who has, who is good in performance, who has much potential, and here are 20 names. It's just about creating a list of names, and, and these names uh, refer to, to, uh, to high potential, to talent, to stars, to to however you name it, but I guess high potential. This is a this is a commonly used term. So you have this twenty high potential, and then you do something like a career planning. And as part of this career planning, you might do something like a three sixty degree feedback. You have a close look at the people. Or say, okay, hey John, you are a high potential. Congratulations. Hmm. So let's have uh, uh, an assessment. Yeah. And whatever this might be, 360 degree feedback or a kind of potential assessment. So simply you have a closer look at John and you want to understand, okay, what are your career aspirations? What is your private situation? So let's build a career plan for you for the next three, five years. Maybe uh, maybe you 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 attend a training, doing an MBA or you attend a... Uh, um, a, a, a specific programs that we have prepared. So this is development 10 and 20, the 10% and the 20%. Maybe you get a coach, you got, might get a mentor, uh, and as I said, maybe some formal trainings. And this is what you plan. This is what you plan. And along with these things, uh, learning from others, and along with the training programs, you also might be assigned to some stretch jobs or stretch projects. Uh, so that you gain experience. Hey, John, why not spending two years abroad? Let's go to Singapore, be the deputy manager of a department there. Right? So this is what, what, what is done after you have been identified as a high potential. You plan measures that help you to develop on the long run. Right? A career development plan, a career... Uh, education, uh, an ex kind of education or plan, right? And this is pretty much done with uh, your mentor or with with uh, with HR, and 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 you know this is a kind of cycle, annual cycle where you constantly look, yeah, what is the plan? Where are you currently, John? And when, what what might be the next step? And one part of this entire annual circle is also planning, and I put this in the end because. Here we talk about something I will not go too deep into, but we very often talk about succession planning in organizations. Succession planning, what is that? It's simply the question of, do we have enough suitable, well-prepared people for our key positions? So if a position in our organization, let's say the CFO position, would become vacant, open, yeah, suddenly, because the current CFO hit a truck, as we used to say in HR, uh, or voluntarily quit. So do would we have a successor? Now, in a year, in two, who would this successor be? And we do not only want to have one potential successor, we want to have three because we want to have a choice. So th this is, you know, very often a list, uh, an Excel list maybe, where where the CEO that the CEO can use and have to put under his uh, uh, some somewhere hiding uh, and, and and always having it available because that that makes the CEO sleep well at night knowing that okay whatever happen in my organization I have enough successor and you have a closer look at this okay so this is the overall circle yeah review uh, performance uh, performance review talent review career planning 
and then all the development measures 10 20 70 and then looking okay where are we currently and what else do we need to do so that was in a few minutes an overview about talent management as you find it in most organizations right okay so and that gives you the impression that there is this one view this one way this one best practices but actually there is not and then uh, what I would like to do now is uh, I would like to refer to a model I, I, I mentioned in a very early episode when we were talking about the strategic types of human resource management and I must refer in this moment to a triangle that I have proposed a triangle why a triangle because the triangle that proposes three extreme um, types of human resource management and in this particular case talent management and I would like to share with you this idea how three extreme types of talent management like might look like and I use this triangle because every corner of this triangle represents one extreme form of talent management and then you uh, as a listener you can think about okay where are we in uh, in, uh, in, in in our organization and as many of you already know, this triangle has three different extremes. One is higher end pay, uh, one is central planning and control, and one is people-centered enablement. So talent management as part of higher end pay, meaning you have no of very limited institutionalization of your human resource management. What does that mean? You don't have processes, you don't have systems, you don't have tools, you don't have an IT, you, you, have, you, you might have nothing, right? You not have nothing. No institutionalization, this is how we named it. Uh, there is no HR and there is no such thing that we can name talent management. So, I mean, that sounds a little bit weird, saying one strategy of talent management is to, ha to do not have a talent management. But what does that mean? Uh, if you go this way, then you believe, you trust in the natural development of the people, right? You, you don't identify people actively, and you don't have any formal measures to develop people. You simply do nothing. And your fundamental idea is that the cream always comes to the top. I mean, there are many companies uh, in, in the world <laughs> yeah, that were extremely successful and they did not have any talent management. Um, some companies say, or some CEO, I, he, I hear, heard some CEO saying, well, I don't want to actively identify talented people. I don't want to actively develop talented people. Talented people must find their way by their own. And if they can't do so, then they are not talented. A talented person is willing and ready and ambitious enough to search his or her way and to go his or her way. The cream always comes to the top. You, you, cannot, you cannot stop talented people. You cannot. If you are talented, then go ahead. <laughs> you don't need any formal system for this. Okay. This is not so wrong, maybe. So you have talent management without having talent management. Okay, the other extreme is when you have on a high level of institutionalization, meaning you have a lot of processes, a lot of systems, a lot of programs, platforms, uh, communities, KPIs, whatever. There might be one way to go saying, okay, as a company, we are responsible for the development of the most talented people. The company does something with the people. That's the idea of central planning and control, another extreme of human resource management saying, we, we, the organization, we, the, the executive board, we, the HR department, we have to identify the most talented people. We have to understand who they are. Once we have them, we do something with them. <laughs> right? 
This is our resource. And we shape the resource. We develop this resource. We, the company, we do something with them. Right? We develop them. Right? So that's really the idea that as an organization, you have the responsibility for the long-term development of your people. Right? This, is, this is the idea here. And you are equipped with a lot of systems. Uh, so as a um, development expert in HR, you, you probably have a system where you can look at all the high potentials in your system and you see, okay, where are they currently? What are their competence profiles? What is their next step maybe? Uh, so you have an overview and you navigate these people through their career and the people, they will stare at you and, and will ask, oh, when will I get promoted? What do you do with me next? <laughs> right? Uh, you have identified me as a high potential, but I'm still not promoted after three years of being nominated. What's what's wrong here? Do something with me. <laughs> so this is you know this. So when you experience this this in your organization that talented people knock on your door, you're in HR department and asking you this, then you probably have at least position your talent management approach as something which is very centrally planned and controlled. And the opposite of a very institutionalized uh, idea is that you say, hey, people, you are responsible for your long-term development. Hey, John, you want to develop on the long run? Are you, you, you are talented? Okay, cool. Are you sure you are talented? How can you be sure? Okay, you're talented? Okay, go ahead. Develop yourself. Do something with you. Not we do something with you, you do something with you. Find your way in the organization. You don't know your way? Okay, we're going to help you. We're going to help you. And and to succeed in your career, we're going to make sure that you meet the right people in the organization. Yeah, Responsibility for your for your career, we're going to provide you. You want to, need to want to meet the smartest people in the organization? Okay, here's the opportunity. So you receive opportunities. You receive transparency about the great universe we have in our organization about all the different development opportunities. Yeah? So you're going to see the universe and we, we, there is an open door, but you have to see it. You have to see the opportunities and you have to take the opportunities. You will not... You will. There, nobody will ever come to you and will present a career opportunity on a plate to you and say, Hey, John, look, here is a position. Do you want to take over this position? No, you have to find the position and you have to fight for it. Fight, fight, fight. Okay. You are responsible for your long-term development. And that does not mean that the organization does nothing. They might do a lot, high, high level of institutionalization. But in the end, the people are responsible for the long-term career. So this is something that... Uh, uh, we think about and we can we will not talk about in the next episodes about the higher and pay approach meaning doing nothing I mean there is nothing to share when uh, the solution is doing nothing you simply do nothing okay what we mainly do is uh, what does talent management mean when the people are responsible for the career what do what does talent management mean when the organization is responsible for the development of the people so these are the two sides uh, that pretty much go along with stability or agility. Uh, so that will puzzle us in the next few episodes. But as I said, this is a fundamental differentiation in, uh, in, in talent management. Absolutely, absolutely crucial. And if you don't get this straight in the beginning, you're going to have endless debates. Really, I promise you. So this is really a strategic decision, which way you want to go. And, and then in the next episodes, we're going to think about, okay, if you want to have a talent management, which is more about people have the uh, responsibility for that development, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of competence models, in terms of talent identification, in terms of development measures? Okay, but that's enough for the moment. And thanks for listening. See you next time. Mm-hmm.